John Byrne back again with Center Court. Today, we're going to dive into Rochester Simon's MBA program. Uh, this is a terrific program. Uh, it's, in fact, it's the first business school I ever visited as a journalist uh, many, many, many years ago. Uh, and I have very fond memories of that initial visit because it really was the first time that I got thrust into the world of business education. With us today, we have Rebecca Lewin, who is Assistant Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid at uh, Simon. And then we have an alum, a two-year alum. Uh, she graduated in the class of 2020, Taylor Torrey. She is at Medtronic doing uh, intelligence work. We're going to find out a lot more about that. Um, many people think you have to be in the CIA to do intelligence work. That's not true. <laughs> Taylor will um, uh, prove that uh, exactly. So, and, and she's in the uh, leadership rotational program at Medtronic, which as many of you already know, is in the medical device field and is the leading company in that industry. So let's talk a little bit about the Rochester Simon MBA. Uh, what makes it distinctive? What makes it different? Uh, what's the culture like? Uh, what can students expect once they sign up to come? Rebecca? Sure. Well, thanks for having me today, John. It's great to be here and talk a little bit about our program and, and what makes it unique and special. I think there's a few things that come to my mind uh, that uh, not only have I observed, but students would consistently tell us. Um, one is the diversity of the student body and just how unique that is and what that means for the learning experience. Um, and when we talk about diversity, we're talking about a lot of different dimensions of diversity, um, academic backgrounds, um, cultural geography backgrounds, uh, uh, gender, race, ethnicity, all of those different pieces are uh, pieces that go into our admission selection process with kind of an intentionality around uh, inviting and encouraging a diverse um, uh, student body and a student learning experience. Um, and what that then translates to is um, not only a kind of a diversity of thought and background, but also I think a consistency in terms of attitude and behavior that um, will still provide a, cul a culture that's supportive and inclusive, that um, helps people to feel like they belong, um, that they want to belong um, and be um, connected uh, within our organization. And so that's something that I think is quite unique. Um, but along with that kind of supportive culture, um, you're gonna find a STEM designated MBA program that has a rigor in the quantitative area of the curriculum that very much aligns with what almost any business, regardless of industry or background, is looking for in managers and leaders of, of organizations, understanding how data drives decision-making, uh, understanding uh, where and how you can use data, um, in strategic ways and operational ways in your business. Uh, and we have designed a curricula that um, allows flexibility in terms of getting a STEM designation um, across a lot of different disciplines, which um, is I think particularly attractive for students. Um, and then I would just say the last piece is uh, providing a co-curricular experience that you know, very amply supports um, the um, career opportunities, as well as the outside of class learning experiences and social experiences that very much make a full-time MBA program what you would want and expect it to be, that you're um, building those strong friendships and connection points with your classmates and ultimately also preparing for and, and accepting great career opportunities like, um, like Taylor's that we just talked about a minute ago. And I should point out that the Simon Business School uh, was the first business school in the United States to get its entire MBA program STEM designated. And it was really a pioneering and creative move uh, by the then dean. And uh, as you pointed out, you could actually go there and do the concentration in marketing and still have a STEM designated degree, which is not true in many other schools mm -hmm. uh, that jumped on this bandwagon well after Rochester established uh, it's STEM designated MBA program. The other thing about, to me, uh, the roots of your MBA are pretty well planted in uh, economics. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, the, one of the reasons why I think the school had this early lead on STEM designation is because, because of that. It was quantitative. It's a purely quantitative program to begin with. 
Uh, and analytics has always been a key part of that, isn't that right? That's true. Yeah. And so for people who really like the idea of having an MBA education with an economics foundation, uh, this is a truly distinctive part of the MBA at Simon Business School. Um, it really is, John. I mean, I think the fascinating thing for me is um, seeing that we have um, appeal and interest um, and enroll, quite frankly, students that have English literature majors, um, as well as students that are engineers, and um, the degree and the STEM opportunity can be available to both. Um, obviously, there's a little bit more of a learning curve for a student that may not have as much of a quantitative background academically, but both types of students can and are successful and um, can be and are um, successful in the program academically. Yeah, and like, and like every really good business school, I mean, the whole idea of poets and quants mm -hmm. is to bring together those liberal arts majors right. with the STEM majors mm -hmm. uh, and make that kind of magic work, right? Exactly. You uh, build on the strengths of both uh, types of students and you minimize the weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Now, Taylor, tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to pursue an MBA in the first place and then what led you to uh, the Simon Business School. Sure. So my background is in nonprofits. Um, after graduating from college in 2010, okay, I here's did a the couple example of number one, right? You signed, right up, <laughs> you signed up for uh, Simon and look, look how well you've done. Right. And here I am. And, you know, I, I did a lot of work with AmeriCorps and then I worked with an education focused nonprofit. And while I was there, I was running into incredible MBA students from all over the country. And I thought, oh, what would it be like to go back to school and do some of the work that they're doing? And so, you know, that led me to thinking about an MBA. And I studied for a GRE and was contacted by admissions at Simon and went for my first visit. And I'm originally from Texas. So I passed every business school in the country to get up to Rochester, New York and fell in love with my first visit there. And so, um, you know, that's what brought me to Rochester. I think it wasn't just the um, focus on culture that, you know, Simon works really hard to cultivate. And I think that the students do a great job in reinforcing, but also I knew that I was going to leave there with a lot of skills that I didn't have and some skills that I didn't even know I needed and um, ended up having an incredible time. Now, Taylor, that's a story of love at first sight. <laughs> so, so what was it? Was there a particular interaction when you went to the campus in Rochester um, that made it click for you? That was the moment that you said, I belong here. I feel like I, this is a great fit for me. Yeah, you know what I think it was that one, I, I ran into a lot of students from Texas and I didn't know what it would be to be someone from, you know, Houston going to a, a smaller city in Western New York. Um, and so I found some community there, but then I realized, you know, we had so many interactions with students. And I think Simon does a really good job, um, especially with admissions and, you know, not only introducing you to staff and the people who are gonna help you through this journey, but really allowing you to build those connections with the students and alumni really early early on. And so those are the people that helped me with my essays and helped me tighten up my resume and, you know, ended up helping me throughout the uh, consortium orientation program, uh, you know, process as I was getting ready for that. And so all of that just made it feel like a really good place where I could spend uh, what I knew was going to be a very rigorous two years, but also have a lot of fun and leave with a lot of new relationships and some lifelong friendships as well. That's great. What was the learning experience like? So you get there, were there surprises in any way? Uh, what, how much rigor was there in that first year of the program? Yeah, you know, the, I think the biggest surprise was, you know, coming from a liberal arts background. I studied economics, but I was in liberal arts. And then taking that first class during pre-fall, um, which is more of an econometrics focused class, I realized, one, it'd been a while since I had, had you know, that kind of uh, <laughs> academic challenge. Um, but I realized, like Rebecca said, I wasn't alone because I had right. other classmates from, you know, different fields and, and some were also in, from nonprofit backgrounds like me. And so, um, um, I think with that team element, I didn't realize how important that was going to be. And man, I don't know how, how any of us would have made it through without having that core team to rely on and learn from. So um, I think, you know, the team aspect was definitely one of those things that I, um, I definitely underestimated. And Rebecca, I'm, I'm imagining that one of the aspects of 
the collaborative community spirit at Rochester is it's relatively small class size where everyone gets to know each other pretty intimately and you get to know the faculty really well as uh, in that process, right? Absolutely. And I think like, like Taylor just mentioned, there is an intentionality around that process starting even during the admissions um, interactions um, so that there's actually some building blocks that, that form early before a student has actually permanently set foot on campus um, as a matriculated student with an intent that that continues to kind of grow and blossom while they're in the program. Because ultimately as a smaller school, we want and need as many students as possible to be involved. And um, so we talk about that throughout our admissions process that we are looking for stakeholders who aren't gonna just sit back and consume, but we're looking for people that want to produce, that want to participate, that want to pay it forward, that want to get involved and, and to, in some way, shape or form, whether it's in a social club that you're really excited about, you know, kind of bringing your classmates together around a particular um, interest that you have, or whether it's through one of the diversity clubs or one of the professional clubs that you're getting involved and you're having an impact on the community around you. So that's absolutely very important for us. And your annual, annual intake in the full-time MBA is how many now? It's typically between about 100 or maybe up to around 120 students in one in a given year. So, and you know, you all classmates well, you celebrate birthdays, uh, <laughs> babies, uh, mergers and acquisitions, as we call them. Um, and, you know, really try to make sure that you know, you're doing life together with these people that, you know, you might start as um, strangers from all four corners of the globe. But within a very short time, you really feel like um, this is your your community and, and people that you're going to not only maintain a professional relationship with, but hopefully a personal relationship that extends well beyond the two years of the program. Now, Taylor, when you went to Simon, I'm assuming that you wanted to do a career transition uh, based on where you are and where you were. Uh, was that your intent or were you undecided when you arrived? So I was undecided on the industry, but I definitely knew I wanted to transition into marketing. And I think the way that I approached it was coming from a nonprofit background. It's very focused on being mission driven. And I always felt really good when I can tell that I, my work was connected to the mission. And so that was that one thread that I wanted to keep throughout my career post MBA. And so the way I approached looking at different industries and companies was, you know, is this something that I feel connected to? Um, is this an industry that I can, you know, I, I understand enough to say, okay, I see how I can make an impact here. And that's how I approached, you know, kind of uh, de deciding between the different opportunities that were um, in front of me and, and thinking about, okay, where is it that I can, you know, know that I'm going to make an impact, but also like feel that and feel really confident about doing that for a while. Right. And were you involved in uh, outside class activities, co-curricular uh, things? I was, I was. I, so one of my, um, I guess the primary involvement that I had was I was a liaison with Simon Consortium. And that was a great opportunity to help, you know, usher in the next consortium class and help build community within the existing consortium, consortium class at Simon. Um, I was also involved with Simon Women in Business. And then um, I did a lot of work with admissions, just, you know, making sure I was attending some of the admission weekends events, volunteering my time there. And then, um, you know, just any one-off opportunities I could to give back or collaborate with um, you know, the staff or with um, other classmates to, you know, drive different initiatives at Simon, whether it was, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, or anything else that, you know, came about, I think. One thing that Simon does a really good job of is um, not only setting the framework that we have as far as clubs and different initiatives that Simon has, but if there is something that a student may see is missing or, you know, they want to improve, there's always resources there, um, whether it's, you know, opening different doors in order for us to have those opportunities. Um, I would say, you know, Simon is, is really welcoming to the students definitely owning that culture and, and being able to make it what they feel like it needs to be for uh, the students. Yeah, this is another, you know, big opportunity in, at smaller cohort sizes where, you know, leadership opportunities are more readily available to people. Uh, so you can exercise those leadership muscles in the co-curricular activities and events uh, of a business school, which is really super helpful. Um, 
how how did it emerge that you ended up at Medtronic? What role did the school play, and what did you learn that helped pave the way uh, to Medtronic? Sure. So Simon played a huge part in me landing at Medtronic. I um, first interacted with Medtronic at the consortium orientation program. And without being a consortium member, I don't know how I would have gotten the, the very specific uh, interaction that I did or, or um, you know, uh, introduction that I did. And so I met a Simon alum who was currently working at Medtronic. Um, and during that conference, I was able to attend a Medtronic um, uh, reception opportunity. And so I got to meet different uh, staff members there and some other consortium alumni. Um, and then, you know, was able to turn that into a first interview and then an invitation to a super day. And so, you know, while I think there could have been other opportunities for me to interact with Medtronic throughout the year, I think being able to connect very early on with an alum who was able to, you know, kind of show me the ropes and, and help me understand the um, application process. And even, you know, as an intern at Medtronic, um, they served as my peer mentor, which was a great opportunity. Um, I think, you know, to me, Simon played a huge role in me having all of those experiences and the experience that I'm having now. That's great. Now, did you have a coach at Rochester? I did. So I had a coach for our orientation program. It was um, a second or at that point, it was a rising second year. Um, and so they helped me, I think, starting in, in March um, after I had gotten my acceptance and we worked on my resume and we worked on my you know, elevator pitch and my star stories leading up until that conference in June. And so um, that was a huge support. I mean, the student was taking time out of her early morning schedule and her weekend schedule to help prepare me and go through different iterations of, you know, all of my materials. Um, and so that was, that was a really huge benefit. I think that all of our, our students had going into um, that orientation program. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, Rebecca, one of my favorite questions is to ask students or graduates of a program, what were the three things that most had an impact on you and that you might remember years later? And we'll, we'll, we'll ask Taylor after I ask you, because you have a more, you know, uh, central view of this, given your contact with so many students, what would they tell me if I were to ask them that question? So, I mean, I think there's some things that have been pretty consistent over the years um, that, um, that students would talk about. I mean, and there are actually things that I think we've already touched on a little bit, but uh, I'll further kind of emphasize and maybe bold and underline. Obviously, the analytics um, is a big piece. I don't, you know, whether you talk to alums from, you know, two or three years ago or 20 or 30 years ago, they're going to talk about the quantitative elements of, of the program. I think it's defined differently depending on um, the two different tools and resources that have continued to iterate and change over the years. But that's a hallmark. And, and I would say almost every student, regardless of what level of quantitative skill they come in with, they're going to say that they left with more tools, better equipped, more confidence um, in, their, in their quantitative and analytic abilities. I think the diversity is another big one that I wanna emphasize. Right. And that's changed a little bit over the years, but you know we have a 53 year um, relationship with the consortium for man management. Um, you know, And so that has um, really been very kind of pivotal in terms of our commitment to um, continuing to increase um, and um, elevate um, individuals who might not have had access or opportunity um, earlier and their education or their careers and, and you know, moving them through um, a full-time MBA program and giving them access and opportunity through uh, their experiences at Simon. Um, we also, uh, you know, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, started to see more international students coming into our program. And so that global diversity um, is another lens. But I think, especially I think in maybe about the past four or five years, we've advanced conversations as an organization to really push ourselves that it's not just meeting certain metrics in terms of an incoming class profile, but it's what does the experience look and feel like for each of our students? And what can we as a, a community of, of staff and faculty, um, stakeholders do to support that experience for all of our students? So that, you know, regardless of all of the different ways that they choose to identify themselves, 
that um, consistently the experience that they have feels supported and feels welcoming. And so that I think that um, as the diversity continues in terms of what the makeup of the student body looks like, we're shifting some of our emphasis and energy to um, continuing to expect more from ourselves in terms of how we how we support the students and that. And then I think the other thing that I would point to that's been pretty consistent that um, I think um, our students um, really step up on is is being an impact oriented school. And you know that's different in terms of the way students are involved or how they give back, whether it's serving their fellow classmates mm -hmm. as a leader of a particular board or it's the kind of work or service that they get involved with. But I mean, Taylor just gave an excellent example of, what pay it forward looks like at Simon. And, and that's one data point, but you know, there's tons that I could point to. And um, you know, for me, it's really heartening as a long-term administrator at the school that I know I can um, send out an email to a current student or an alum and say, hey, I need your help with this. Um, I need you to connect with a current student to help with coaching, or I need you to reach out to this prospective student to talk about your experiences. And um, unless someone's in the middle of a major, you know, career change or, you know, on the cusp of getting married, almost always, um, not only do I hear back really quickly, but, you know, the the willingness to say yes and get involved is something that that we really try to cultivate and, and kind of lean into, not just while they're students in the program, but after they um, graduate. And so it may look different. You know, sometimes you're giving your, your time, especially early after you know, you graduate or early in your time at Simon, um, but over, you know, over the course of your career, maybe it shifts towards your talents or your treasure um, in terms of how you're getting involved or, or having an impact, um, you know, within our Simon community, as well as the broader Rochester community. So those would be the, the ways I would describe the experience and some of the consistency that I've seen over the past few years. Great. Taylor, would your three hallmarks of your experience coincide with what Rebecca just said, or do you have some additional points to make? Yeah, I mean, I think they definitely coincide. One thing that I'll say is, and I'm still in awe about how well my class got along. And it was just, you have, you know, a hundred so people from different backgrounds. And I'm still trying to figure out what is it that Simon is doing to create this perfect class and this perfect opportunity. And I think each class has their own personality, but, you know, we seem to fit so well together. And I think that was huge, especially as you, you know, you get into the point where you um, get to decide who you're working with and you get to decide who are your groups in these different, you know, classes. And then you meet people who've been wanting to work with you, or you know, you have people that you really want to work with. And I think that speaks a lot to the trust that you're able to develop within your class, um, with it with such a small class. Um, and I also think that speaks to you know the opportunities that we're given. And um, I think another thing I would add to is you know coming from, I went to a, a very large, um, you know, undergraduate university. And so coming to Simon and, you know, being able to really have good conversations with professors and step into their office for office hours and, you know, take multiple classes with them if it was available. I think that was huge and be able to not only have, you know, those interactions with the staff at Simon and with your, your you know, fellow students, but also with the faculty, um, you know, that was something that I was really looking forward to and is something that I'm so happy I was able to get. And, you know, it's it's great to not only have like your favorite professors, but know that they probably remember you. I remember having you in class. Um, and I think that's always just a great feeling and speaks to, um, you know, just the Simon community at, whole, at, a, at a whole and, you know, what's what we've built here and, you know, what continues to last from year to year. Did you have a favorite course? I did. Actually, I had, I had two favorite courses. So I think the absolute favorite one, just because I learned so much was marketing research. And, you know, I learned how to develop a perfect survey and how to like really, you know, get in there and work in Excel and be as analytical as possible and learned so much and got to really apply what we learned in our, um, you know, data analysis class. And, that to me, I think opened my eyes into what I was interested in when it came to marketing and has led to what I'm doing now with the competitive intelligence piece of my role. Um, and I think the other project or the other class I really liked was a project based, based class um, that we took at the end of our first year that just, you know, really allowed us to work with. Um, you know, an actual business and provide a real solution and do real research. And um, 
that's one opportunity that, you know, I am so grateful for and still think back to. And um, it's just, it's great to be able to have those hands-on experiences and really be able to apply what you're learning in the classroom. Yeah, here's a question from our audience, which I think a lot of people would be interested in. Uh, what was it like living in Rochester? Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed living in Rochester. Um, I think it was so different from Houston um, that I was able to really explore. And, you know, there's, I, I find that Rochester comes alive a lot in the summer and there's different festivals and things to do. And so I was able to experience a little bit of that. Um, but I think, you know, Every, everyone loves their first winter. And, you know, once they get through it, they're like, I did it. You know, I've got all the right gear now. I know how to be fashionable in snow boots. Um, and uh, I think, you know, Simon also does a really good job of giving you different opportunities to explore, not just Rochester, but Western New York. And so, you know, we took advantage of the fact that you know, we could go to Toronto or we could, you know, people went to Buffalo and to a, a Bills game. And so um, I enjoyed living in Rochester. I, I think uh, you're so busy with school that, um, you know, when you have the time to break away from studying and hang out, there's opportunities to do that. Um, but it's not too distracting to where you feel like that's all you want to do. Um, so I, I really enjoyed my time in Rochester. Great. Now, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you to put yourself uh, into the place four years ago where you were exactly at where many of the people in the audience are right now. You're considering an MBA program. You're thinking about what school to go to. What advice do you have based on your own experience? That's a great question. Um, one thing I would say is like, don't forget what you want in the process. I think a lot of times you, you get... A, advice and you get some really good advice and that's great, but you ultimately have to think about what it is that you were wanting to get out of this experience at first. And even if that changes, just make sure that you're checking in with yourself. If you're considering different schools or still considering what, you know, what you want to focus on, is it going to be finance or consulting or marketing, really do what you need to do to make sure you have a good understanding of what that is so that when it's time to recruit and it's time to have those conversations or even picking your classes, um, you're on that path and you're you know, keeping yourself on that trajectory um, to get the things that you want. Um, I think the other thing that's really important is, you know, to relax. I know this is a really stressful time, um, especially if you are just now studying for, you know, the GRE or the GMAT um, or you're, you know, thinking, you know, is the MBA something that I want to do right now? Um, have fun with it. You know, there's, this is, I would say to me, I felt like, you know, that those decisions that I made were some of the toughest decisions, but after that getting into school, there's so much excitement around it. Um, it was really easy to be like, whew, okay, now let's focus on, you know, these first couple of classes or just, you know, understanding, you know, what the, this next two years is going to be all about. But, um, it's, it's meant to ha for you to have fun. There's going to be a lot of learning and there's going to be some, you know, some tough times and it may, you know, sound really challenging when you're talking to different people, but when you're in it, you're not alone. You have classmates. There are, you know, people that are making the same decisions that you're making right now. So, um, you know, enjoy the process, know that the, the decisions that you're making and the choices that you make, um, are ones you should be confident in. And I think that will set you up for success. That's great advice. Rebecca, do you have any additional advice for prospective students out there? Yeah, I mean, I think the one thing that I would say is kind of don't overthink um, the process. I know it's easy to kind of get up in your head and try to figure out what does the admissions office want me to say to the as I answer this interview question or this essay. Um, and there's a piece of this where, um, you know, at the end of the day, you need to be yourself and, you know, you know yourself best and uh, we're not necessarily looking as you, as you've heard today for all of our students to come in with the exact same backgrounds or the exact same answers to our questions. In fact, if they do, we'd have a really hard time making decisions because everyone would look the same. And so um, to the extent to which you can let yourself show through in the process and um, really try to get to know us, I, I try to remind students that it's, an, it's in our collective best interest as admissions officers and as students for you to put your best foot forward so that we can take that into consideration. And so um, we actually, you know, try to use our 
admissions webinars or admissions events to, to provide insights about the application and admissions process so that you can use that information as you're preparing your materials and, and try to uh, put your best foot forward during the application admissions process. And so I would just say in general, um, make sure you're budgeting the time to have those conversations, not just with admissions, but with um, current students, with alums, and that hopefully can serve as a bit of a guidepost as you're trying to check the balance between kind of here's the facts about the school as well as kind of here's my opinions about the interactions I've had because there's a piece of the decision that is kind of can be very objective and fast fact-based, but at the end of the day, this is um, not just a two-year experience, but it's also going to be, you know, your professional and, and hopefully your personal network for, for many, many years to come, and one that uh, you want to feel like it's the right fit for what you're looking for and what your needs are. So true. Now, Rebecca, if someone would like to reach out to you or a member of your team, what's the best way to do that? So, I mean, email is a great place to start. And so you're, you're welcome to, to send an email to admissions at simon.rochester.edu or to even to look me up on LinkedIn or, or I think my email is actually on the Simon website as well. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll make a connection uh, for you to chat with one of the members of the admissions team. We actually have a few people and that's basically their job. Like they, you know, schedule appointments with candidates, whether it be in Zoom or we're, we're out on the road traveling again. Um, that just started over the past month, which, which is exciting. And so um, there's a number of different cities around the U.S. and even some international cities where we're going to be visiting over the next few months. And so we'd love to make a connection point. And then we also host different events on campus. We have a diversity conference and a women's conference that we're hosting this fall and several other events during the winter that are really designed uh, to do exactly what Taylor just talked about, get you on campus, help you to meet some people, um, allow us to meet you. It's for, for both sides, a 30 minute interview is pretty short. And so this allows you more time um, to get to know us and, and for us to get to know you as well. So we'd love for you to pick the mode that best fits the amount of time you have and your schedule, um, but to start that conversation so we can get to know you. Fantastic. Well, Rebecca and Taylor, thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate it. I think we learned a lot about the program at Rochester. And I think um, hopefully you'll find a lot of people who are very much interested in going to the Simon Business School. Taylor, good luck uh, to you in the rest of your career. You have a long roadway ahead of you and you've got a great start. And Rebecca, thank you for being so insightful and thoughtful program in the school. This is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. You've been watching Poets and Quants Center Court series, and we've been focusing on Rochester's Simon Business School here. Thanks for watching.